Uh, I have to tell you, um, it, it is the highest honor. It's the favorite thing that I get to do in my life um, is get when I get to do this, when I get to study and read God's word and, and, and then present it and let the spirit move through me and impact you. And um, that's a privilege and a pleasure to get to study the word. The, we spend weeks on each of these messages. It's not just me. There's a whole preaching team. And uh, we refine and we curate uh, the content. But um, in that process, I always have to examine how this text applies to me. Because one of our core values here is authenticity with self. It's the first one. We need to be authentic with ourselves. And it's hard for me to preach or teach what I haven't figured out how to apply to myself. And sometimes it's really painful, to be honest. And what I learned over the last few weeks is that I've spent a lot of time in my life seeking affirmation. I spent a lot of time in my life trying to make sure that people like me, right? And that I present a positive image from the clothes that I wear, the brands that I endorse, or the things that I post. I want to make sure that, you know, that you like me. Because frankly, those likes, they're addictive. They feel good. Um, psychologists and biologists will tell you that um, there's something about that digital like. It releases dopamine, and dopamine is the feel-good agent in your bloodstream. It's the thing that, yeah, brings on some happiness. But the problem with that hit, like any other addiction, it's only temporary. It doesn't last. It doesn't sustain. And this becomes really problematic for people like me that get to do things like this and stand in places like this who have this desire to be approved, wow, in some very subtle and dangerous ways, I can maybe tell a story as an illustration to a sermon that brings more glory to me than it does to God. Or maybe I can curate or select a version of the text that won't be offensive because, man, I don't want you to be mad at me. That's a dangerous road. That's, that's a place we don't want to go. It creates hypocrisy. See, this preaching team helps keep me in line. And our goal, wherever you are on your faith journey, if you are in a place of doubt and I don't understand what you guys are talking about, how you can believe that, we are so glad you're here. If you've been a Christian for 50 years, we are so glad you're here because we believe that there's a message every week, every day from the Bible to help us be better. My job is not to entertain you. That's not our goal. Our goal is life change. And over the last three weeks, life change, being authentic, begins with me. So with all that as a preamble, I want to tell you that there are times that I put on a mask like a hypocrite, and I do not present my authentic self. It's kind of like the great Wizard of Oz. He's up there, and he's talking, and he's... He's making his big proclamation when all the time the real person is hiding behind a curtain, so afraid of being discovered, so afraid that they yell, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Sometimes I think it would be easier if I was preaching behind a curtain. But that's the tension. And I don't think I'm alone. In fact, I know I'm not alone. Psychologists back me up here. And you don't need us to be a psychologist or look at a, a psychology study. If you've ever seen a child, if you've ever had a child, if you've ever been a child, you have participated in this. Mommy, Daddy, watch me. Mommy, Daddy, look. Mommy, Daddy, look. And what do Mom and Dad do? Loving parents, what do they do? They watch, and the child attempts to perform a somersault. And it's pitiful. 
And they attempt to come down the slide, and it's slow. And they attempt to sing the song, and it's off key. And we say, oh, that's so good. We love you, child. Which just repeats the whole cycle over and over again. It can be taxing, and it can be wearing. We've been doing this. We've been seeking approval since we could speak. And where it becomes really dangerous is when that desire for approval bleeds over into our righteous acts, into our religious acts. Because it becomes very possible for that religious thing that's supposed to glorify God to become a selfish thing glorifying yourself. So how do we deal with that? How do we manage that that tension, because it is in us. We all like to be liked. But the danger is if, especially Christians, if the mask is exposed, and it will be, if the curtain is drawn back, and it will be, then we're hypocrites. And what's the number one reason our children and our grandchildren and our friends don't want anything to do with the church. It's hypocrisy. They can smell it. They can see it. We have to be so protective, not just for ourselves, but so that we don't stand in the way in the advancement of the kingdom of God. So how can we do this? Jesus tells us we don't need to perform. We don't need to perform. We don't need to be stuck in the addiction what we can do is practice the discipline of secrecy, which is pretty ironic because we spend a lot of time hiding our authentic selves. But Jesus is telling us we need to practice the discipline of secrecy. So open up your phone, get your Bible out, scroll to where you need to be. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 as we're continuing this study of the Sermon on the Mount. We've been all the way through chapter 5. We're finally turning the page to chapter 6. And most recently, we've been focused on the six antitheses that Jesus presents. It's a fancy way of saying, you have heard it said, but I say. And you'll remember, Jesus said, you have heard it said, don't murder. But I say, don't commit character assassination by calling somebody a fool. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say the audacity. But I say, even if you look on another person lustfully, you're degrading them. You're demoralizing them. You're committing adultery. So Jesus focused on these six behaviors that everybody was focused on. How am I supposed to, what am I not supposed to do? And he changes the, the paradigm a little bit. And now turning to chapter six, instead of six antitheses, He's going to focus on righteous behavior. He's going to give us three case studies, and we're going to cover all three today. Three case studies where our righteous behavior, we think we're doing the right thing, but we can be misdirected. Once again, Jesus is changing the paradigm. So, with me, let's look at chapter 6, verse 1. I'm sorry. Yeah, where's verse 1? I've lost my text. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Jesus starts with be careful. He recognizes the tension. He sees the desire that we all have to be approved. But we all, Christians especially, we want to do righteous things. And if those two collide... The Father's not going to reward us. In fact, we'll get our reward in a temporary nature from man, and it will not sustain. So we have to be careful. And the other thing you need to notice in this, this very first verse, Jesus is calling out the fact that we have dual citizenship. Your Father in heaven, so my Father's in heaven, so uh, I'm a naturalized citizen. I'm born as a child of God. I'm part of the kingdom. But we're here on earth. And we pray that we advance the kingdom. We be a part of the advancement of the kingdom for the restoration of all things. 
We talked about this at Houseboats with the youth group. We're ambassadors. We are sent here with a purpose as ambassadors. But we have to remember not to go local. We have to remember that we are sent here by a king to represent the kingdom of God. So Jesus is calling out this dual nature. If we spend all of our time performing for the world, going local, we're not going to benefit the kingdom and we're not going to be rewarded in a kingdom manner. Let's move to verse 2. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So notice again, when you give, not if you give. Jesus is expecting that we will be giving. We will be generous people. And then he says, I love this. Local collo or modern colloquialism, do not toot your own horn. We are not supposed to toot our own horn. We're not supposed to be like hypocrites. We're supposed to be generous, advancing the kingdom, but we don't want to miss out on the reward by tooting our own horn by what we're doing. True confession time. Here's an image of a post I made a few years ago from Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Many of you know I've been involved in a ministry in Haiti, uh, taking care of children and widows, widows and orphans in their distress. Now, what you're not seeing are all the other posts over the last 15 years I've been in Haiti that I've now scrubbed and deleted because frankly, while I was super proud of the organization and really proud of the work, I was also a little bit self-proud. And I wanted everybody to know that I was involved in doing ministry in Haiti. And I had pictures of the kids, that, you know, and I deleted those because that's robbing those children of their dignity. But even this one, I'm in the back of a pickup truck and I'm flying my best preacher hair. And you have to ask yourself, I have to ask myself, why did I even post this? Why did I need, feel the desire to let everybody know that I was in the back of a pickup truck in Haiti doing a righteous act? And God was blessing those righteous things. God has done tremendous work in Haiti, even though I made it into, at times, a selfish act. It's there. It's dangerous. And we need to fight it. So... How do we make sure we don't fall into that trap? Next verse. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. There's a lot to unpack here. This is what... Dallas Willard calls practicing the discipline of secrecy. So let's focus on practice. What does it mean to practice? And discipline, we're all disciples of Christ. So what does it mean to practice a discipline of secret? First, practice. The best analogy I could come up with, contemporary analogy, which actually dates me because it takes me right back to 1978 and high school typing class. Did anybody take typing in high school? Now, I know voice recognition is going to quickly do away with typing, but some of us still have skills, and we move from ASDF, JKL, semicolon, to double fingers. I got that. But in my day, before the PC, the tool for doing typing, the tool for word processing was the IBM Selectric 2. Anybody remember the IBM Selectric, right? Had you have your keys just perfectly set on there, right? And had to learn. And of course, I was in high school when I was on the IBM Selectric too. So the first thing I learned to type were dirty words, right? And then all the boy, all the kids would snicker and, and all that. But truly, I need to thank the teacher for persisting with me and making us persist because the goal was we had to get to 50 words per minute with no errors for five minutes. And the reason that was the goal is 
once that platen or the bobbin hit the ribbon and put the word or the letter on the page, it was really, really hard to change. And I remember ASDF, AT, AT, AZ, Zebra, right? I remember doing all that and have, I don't remember the moment. I don't remember the day. But eventually I got to the place where I could type without even looking. Carriage return. <laughs> Jesus wants us to practice our acts of righteousness in such a way that we're doing it and we don't even know we're doing it. We don't even know. It's just natural. I can type. It's just natural. So that's the practice. But then let's talk about this secrecy thing. Clearly, Jesus cannot be saying that we're supposed to do all of our good acts that God has prepared in advance for us to do. He cannot be saying that they all need to be done in secret. All you have to do is scroll up, turn back, Chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus exhorts us to let our light shine before men so that our good works will bring glory to God. So he can't be saying do everything in secret. What I've learned is every time Jesus says something that seems incongruous with something else that Jesus says, I probably don't get it. And as Jesus has done already in the Sermon on the Mount. Once more, he's changing the paradigm on secrecy. And what I mean by that is he's saying, you guys have been using secrecy as a tool to hide yourselves. I'm saying use secrecy as a tool to make sure your motives are pure and use secrecy as a tool to get out of the performance and into the knowledge that God loves you he's totally shifted the way we should be using secrecy the practice of secrecy i've got a i made this up i think it's right but i think what jesus is getting to is this model here secrecy always impacts intimacy let me see it again. Secrecy always impacts intimacy. Let's take marriage. The most intimate moments in any marriage are the most private. The most intimate moments in any marriage are the most private. They are not shared. It's where true authenticity can be experienced. However, if somebody in secrecy has an affair they will definitely impact the intimacy of that marriage so what's done in secrecy will either hinder or foster intimacy and that applies with god as well now what this also says jesus picked up on this uh well actually we'll go to uh, samuel the prophet Samuel was supposed to, God said, hey, go find the next king. I want you to, to anoint him, the next one, because Saul is kind of losing it. And so he goes to Jesse. Jesse has, I think, 12 sons. And he says, bring your sons out. And he brings them out. And the first one he brings out is Eliab. And Eliab is tall, handsome, good-looking, articulate, Samuel's like, that must be him. That must be the one. But God speaks to Samuel and he says, Do not look at his appearance or on the height of his stature, for I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus confirms this in Luke. He said, it's kind of scary. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, nothing hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed through the roofs. Now that can be scary. There are no secret sins. 
And it can be really scary to know that God knows everything. I mean, he is omniscient. And I want a God that knows everything. And it can be really scary to know that eventually everything is going to be revealed. But I would do God a disservice if I left you with the impression that God is this great spiritual surveillance authority. God is not a spiritual CIA. He is not the KGB. He is not just waiting to catch you doing wrong. He knows everything, but he's not out to get you. Yes, he knows everything. But he's not watching you to catch you. He's gazing on you lovingly. He loves you. You don't have to perform anything. You're already approved. He loves you. He loves you. There's an app I use daily called Pray As You Go. And it, beautiful music and it, and beautiful English accents, um, reads from the Bible. And I just, I've come to love this app. It's produced by Jesuits. But the first thing it asks you to do every morning, become aware of the loving gaze of God. When we're in that private, secret place, that intimate place, aware that God truly loves us, like a mother gazes on her child, then we can know our motives are pure. Jesus isn't saying, do all your good things in private, but he is saying, do them even though nobody might be watching. He'll take care of getting the glory. You just do the act and don't try to steal the glory from him. We don't have to get approval from others. We're trading temporary likes for knowing the love of God. And the rewards here, I think the first reward is the internal knowledge of knowing that we are loved. We are loved. Because then we can be our most honest, naked, and unashamed self with God in private places. Second case study, prayer. So we're going to move to the next verse. This is verse 5. And Jesus says, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray... Go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen, and then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. But don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask them, before you ask him. A lot to unpack here. But first, just notice the structure's the same. He substituted the righteous act of prayer, corporate prayer, for good deeds and righteousness. But if we're doing them on the streets so that we can be seen, if we're praying out loud so we can impress others with our big words and our intensity and our emotion, there's no reward. Somebody might come up and say, oh boy, you're such a prayer warrior, I'm so, thank you, that was so, but that's all you're going to get. Which is kind of scary, because prayer should be something that brings us in alignment with God's will. I'm confident that Jesus is talking about the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, and Mark, he says, uh, watch out for the teachers of the law. They walk around in flowing robes to be greeted with respect in the marketplace. They have the most important seats in the synagogue. They devour widows' houses. I mean, you can't get any lower than that. Taking the home of a widow? Putting her on the street? 
They devour widows' houses, and for show, they make lengthy prayers. Jesus is equating that kind of showboating prayer to devouring a woman's house, a widow's house. It's that serious. We wouldn't stand for that. We're not going to do that. Now, Jesus, again, can't be saying no corporate prayer. He taught us to pray corporately. Next week, we will be examining the Lord's Prayer, which begins with our. It's in plural. The whole thing is in plural. Jesus prayed out loud often, just as he did righteous deeds in public. Even from the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wanted us to hear that. But Jesus also had a daily practice of going away on his own in the early morning to pray in secrecy with the Father so that he could be affirmed of God's love for him. So he could experience God's loving gaze upon him. So yes, there are times of secret prayer where we are blessed. And there are times of corporate prayer where we work together as children of God. We want prayers not made in puffery, but with authenticity. Now, this is also encouraging because he talks about the babbling. You don't need to babble. I mean, like the pagans, they were trying to manipulate their gods. We cannot manipulate God. But it says, he knows what you need even before you ask it. Again, think of a good mother. She knows what the child needs even before they ask. She packs the juice box, she packs the binky, the, all the stuff that the child might need. Ready, anticipating when they ask. Sometimes, frequently, moms don't grant us what we ask because they know better. The fourth cookie is not going to serve you well. And then sometimes, the child skins a knee and they're suffering and they're hurting. She always draws close to the child as if it's a secret, a private place. And maybe she can't fix the pain immediately, but she says, I know. Jesus promised, and we don't like to talk about it, that in this world we will have trouble. The world, it's corrupt. It literally is corrupt. Sin and bad things happen. And I would be a hypocrite if I didn't acknowledge that here. And when we go to God in prayer, in secrecy, and we reveal our pain, our suffering, even our desire for approval, God, it's not fair. They get all the attention. God, nobody notices me. God, am I ever going... God, God, why am I suffering? The reward? You get to hear, I know. I know. It hurts me too. And then we move to the third case study. We're going to jump down to verse 16 because we're going to cover the Lord's Prayer next week. And you don't want to miss Jesus' recipe, not for babbling prayers, but for intelligent prayers. God wants us to use our intellect as we pray. But we're going to move to fasting. Verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And again, your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. We could spend a whole sermon on fasting. We won't. But fasting is the practice of denying yourself something to create a sense of need that you then fill by drawing closer to God. Fasting is a response or an anticipation of a significant event. And it can be done corporately or it can be done privately. But if you 
our fasting, which is, creates discomfort. If you are fasting and you're letting everybody know you're fasting by your misery, that's all the benefit you're going to get? It's not really worth it. Corporate fasting is a thing. Not too long ago, a couple months, three months ago actually, Marty sent an email to a group of us and he asked if we would pray over specific topics for the next six weeks and every Tuesday if we would fast. We didn't announce that. We kept that very, very private because we wanted together to make sure that we weren't drawing attention to ourselves but listening to what God has for Mountain View Church. So again, it's the motive behind the action that's essential. It's the motive behind the action that's essential. Are you willing to fast to give something up so that you can be drawn closer to God even if nobody knows? So what do we do with all this today? I think the very first thing is to recognize, just like Jesus said, be careful. He recognizes the tension we have of seeking approval and doing righteous acts and not letting those two things mix. Oh, God's happy when we do our acts of righteousness and we help advance the kingdom. But we don't have to perform for his love. We do not have to perform for his love. If we did, we would be human doings and not human beings. And yet, when we are being, when we are alone with Jesus, we'll learn of the acts he's prepared in advance for us to do. But those are in response, not to earn his pleasure, but out of his pleasure. We have to be very careful that we don't turn our intimacy with God into public praise by putting ourselves in the center of the story rather than God's glory. We do not want to let the temporary, the social media likes only last for at most two days, and then we seek the next one. We don't want to let the temporary rob from the eternal because while those likes are temporary, God's love, grow, our awareness of God's love grows deeper and deeper and deeper the more time we spend in intimacy with him. Secrecy, I believe, always impacts intimacy. And we need to practice the discipline of secrecy. If we hide and keep secrets, it will hinder. If we practice the discipline of secrecy with God, it will promote intimacy. We need to become aware of his loving gaze on us. And when we're in those moments of secret prayer, I think that's the time we can ask God three questions. Have a discussion. And there's three questions, I think, that are worthy of asking when it comes to this topic. Why am I doing this? Who's watching me? And what about this religious deed brings me pleasure? And I think if we have an honest discussion with God, He will assure that our motives are pure and we will not trade the temporary for the eternal rewards that He offers us. In reviewing this message um, this week, the team brought up um, a letter Paul wrote to Colossae, to a church. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to pick up with verse 2. I can't think of a better closing summary for what we've been discussing this morning. Paul says, Set your minds on things above. Dual citizenship. Yes, you're here, but set your mind on things above. Not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ. Intimacy. You are hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, 
appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Talk about a reward. I've been examining this passage for the last three weeks, and boy, did it reveal a lot, and I revealed just some of where I've struggled in this area. Maybe it's hitting you too. I'd like to ask you to do this. Close your eyes, bow your head. Become aware of God's loving gaze upon you. You don't have to perform. And maybe you've messed up. But he loves you and he approves of you. And then please just listen to these words from David. He wrote this prayer in Psalm 139. And let some of these words become your words in this secret place of you with God. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way in the reward of everlasting. 